discussing some details about how they work. Okay? Um, and I'd again encourage people's questions to draw at that discussion. Uh, in today's lecture, uh, I'm going to be emphasizing some components of those models that tie in particularly to this topic, which I started to introduce last time of, of subclassing and subclassing. And this is uh, probably the most technically demanding uh, topic that we've yet dealt with, but it's also one that, that has, um, you know, hopefully will explain a lot of things that are otherwise puzzling about any logic and uh, about agent-based modeling more generally. Um, and I'll be tying this in with particular models. Uh, so first thing I thought I'd do would be to, to talk about some of the, the conceptual, um, conceptual issues here. So um, in the closing minutes of the last session, I had talked about um, uh, this notion of encapsulation, the fact that within software we try to separate, on the one hand, the contract or the what um, something accomplishes from the details of the how. Um, and I argued that the risk of change was a big motivator for this separation. The fact that the things can evolve in our model and we try to, we try to design a model so that that evolution of pieces of the model causes us the least trouble possible. It, we're, we're buffered from it, we're protected from it. Um, and um, I argued that um, classes uh, as well as, as functions both benefit from a separation of the what, the contract, the things that they promise. You give me this, I will give this back to you. Um, that characterization of what they accomplish from the details of the implementation. Um, and I argued that this facilitates modularity. Um, and typically we have some specification that describes the what, putting aside the how. And often that's just in English. It's a combination of, of the name of the method, say, and some, some brief text uh, about the method. And this distinction between interface and implementation, I argued, forms a key role in many areas of, of human activity. And I gave some examples from practical life where you benefit from a separation of, of what is guaranteed from the, the vagaries of how that's actually accomplished. Um, uh, I heard that, I, I said that you could view taking a taxi, something as simple as taking a taxi is an example of this. You have a standardized interface, you know, that whatever taxi you get into in New York, there's going to be a meter, and in that meter you could be able to pay with a credit card. and. Uh, the particulars of which taxi picks you up, which taxi takes you in the morning, which taxi takes you back in the evening to the hotel, are not really your concern because they're more or less interchangeable. They all adhere to a standard. They all adhere to a well-defined interface and guidelines that allows you to count on their behavior and leave the details of which taxi is dispatched where, with what type of vehicle they use, et cetera, up to um, specialized companies that deal with that. And I argue that franchises, it's the same way. You know, you can look up the FedEx uh, website and find the details of when packages have to be in, find out details of, of what the pricing is on them, and, and then send them via any FedEx uh, courier. You can walk into a U.S. Postal Office knowing what stamps are required and mail your package, more or less interchangeably. And I argued in the computer world that this sort of separation is a great boon because it allows us to use our computers interchangeably in different networks around the world, allows us to build apps that run on a large number of different smartphones, and it's really what's allowed the proliferation of computer hardware over the past several decades. The fact that um, there's a separation of, of what it what it means to be a Windows PC from the particular company that happens to make that, for example, is what uh, what allowed uh, Microsoft-based uh, systems to proliferate 
uh, over the period of about two decades. Similarly, with Linux, machines that run Linux, there's a specification of what's required, and and when you um, when you provide a, a Linux system, it doesn't have to worry all about all sorts of details of what system system it's on. I argue that this encapsulation, the separation on the one hand of the standards or the contract or the interface from the implementation has a number of benefits. Uh, uh, one of them is modifiability. You could change one piece of the project without breaking the other code because the other pieces of the project don't come from the details. They don't come from the how. They just come from what's promised. As long as you retain what's promised, you could change those details without breaking things. Just as um, when you take a taxi to work from your hotel in New York City in the morning, if that particular taxi breaks down, it doesn't matter because there could be a different taxi that takes you back. It's interchangeable. You can substitute one for another. And you can, it turns out, um, reuse. This is something we'll see more in the models we go through today. You can reuse the same code over and over again. Say the code that processes agents um, and loops through agents and um, reports some details on them could work with both uh, male and female agents. It can work with perhaps deer, people, and moose. Uh, in your model. Uh, so, so this separation is, is quite important from the point of view of, of several desiderata. Um, and uh, when we're talking about defining this interface, we're seeking a sort of contract. It says, you give me this, I'll give you that. If you promise, give me these things, where these things are guaranteed, I will promise you that I'll accomplish this. And we accomplish that through so providing some specification in English typically of what a method accomplishes, where a lot of it is often provided by the name alone. So what we're going to be talking about is, is how we provide in Java a separation of interface from implementation. Okay? And it's done in two separate ways. And this is why I say this is probably some of the most technically challenging material we'll encounter in this course. One way in which it's done is by providing what's called an interface construct. So we could actually have, we have classes, and then we can have a thing called an interface. And classes can implement that interface. A class can typically implement multiple interfaces. So the interface defines some, some contract. It says, I will provide these services. And a given class could provide several different interface worth of services. The second way in which um, we can define an interface is actually together with the class, but then that class can be, as it's called, subtyped, and, and we'll see that. So here we're providing an interface um, together with an implementation, but people could use that interface for subtypes of that class as well. So it's, it, it's, it's, um, that separation is actually um, realized through the use of, of sub subclassing and particularly subtyping and particularly subclassing. So I'll be talking about these two things um, more. Okay, so in Java, if a given class implements an interface, we, we say that it we use a keyword that says implements, and we'll we'll see that um, in a little bit here. Implementing an interface at a class allows one to deal with that class as as though it were sort of any anything that provides that service. So something could be written just assuming the properties of that interface and you could give it an instance of that class and it will be happy and, and operate on that. Okay, and, and we'll say the type of the class is a subtype of the type associated with the interface. So for example, we might have an interface that's called presentable and that interface supports a draw method, it supports a disappear method, Perhaps another interface might be called serial number, and you could, if something is serial number, you can call a method called ID, and it will give you back an ID in the form of an integer. And then we could say there's a class X that implements presentable and serial number. And what that means is that class X provides those services. If that uh, if you call its if, if you could count that you could call on its ID method, for example to get an ID because it's serial number. You could count with the fact that it has a draw method because it is presentable. So this interface, which would typically be accompanied by some comments that 
talk more about what it guarantees. This interface provides services, and by virtue of a class implementing that interface, it can make use, um, someone who uses that class knows they can make use of those services. And in fact, uh, if you had an instance of class X, particular, just like this, if class X were a person in your model, and you had a particular, so the person class, and you had a particular person, you could count on that person being protected. So you could you could call their draw method, for example. Okay. Um, and um, turns out that that within Java or generally within any logic, there's um, lots of cases where exactly this is done. So, for example, there's an interface called set, and the interface called set provides a number of methods. Um, and then there's a set of classes, for example, which implement that. There's a class called concurrent skip list set. There's another one called enum set, another one called hash set, uh, another called linked hash set. And each of these has their own peculiar strengths and weaknesses, potentially additional functionality beyond what's provided by set. But they all provide the set interface. You can all count on certain things. It's just like if you were to take a taxi in New York City, you're guaranteed that it has a meter that runs with a certain set of rules based on distance and time and all those sort of things, based on the time of day, the fact that it's a congested time or what have you. You're guaranteed that it runs according to those rules. You know that it will take Visa cards and MasterCards, etc. But it may have additional features, like the taxi you get in may additionally have seat warmers, or it may have you know, extra luggage capacity or what have you. That's all fine and good, but you're guaranteed that it provides that set of services. And by virtue of a class implementing an interface, you know, okay, it provides those services. It will likely provide some additional services. So enum set and half set probably provide a number of different services, each of, of their own type. Okay, so some of these, for example, might be optimized for small sets, others for large sets, et cetera, okay? Um, now, when we have a class that implements a set, that class is itself associated with some sort of contract. And that contract is, is associated, it has a relationship with the contract of the thing it implements. So if we have a type, type A, say a person class that implements a type B, we say it's a subtype of type B. And what that means is wherever a Type B is expected. So we have person implements presentable, it provides presentable services. Wherever there's a presentable required in the code, you could provide a person as an instance of that, as, as a thing that implements it. Um, I, could, I could make use of a person as, as a presentable. It's a perfectly legitimate type of presentable and may provide additional services but it, it is compatible in all senses with its super type. So if we have class X here, as we've described it here, and it implements presentable, if we have some code that interacts with presentables, for example, draws them, we could make use of a class X in that code. We have, if we need a reference to a presentable, we could give it a reference to an X. And from that on, it will just treat it as a presentable. It'll yes, OK. So this is an important point. So imagine that we have some code, uh, perhaps a method, OK, which is called uh, uh, draw me or something like that, OK? Um, and suppose this method, maybe this is a method in any logic, and when we list out its parameters, its, its arguments, we see that it takes, as an argument, a reference to a presentable. Okay, we'll call it P. Okay. So, so this method, we have to give it a presentable P, and when we give it to it, it will do something to it. And suppose what it does is it calls the draw method of a presentable. We see that that's possible because we have a presentable. So suppose there's this method and 
head, we call draw on it. Now we could call draw me, so if we had a class person, class person, right here it says class X, but suppose it was class person, and it implements presentable, okay? Um, uh, what that means is that it provides all the services of presentable. Okay? Um, so if I said, you know, class taxi implements meter, then I know that taxi implement or implements New York City meter, then I know that this this taxi, you know, any any taxi will implement the New York City meter services. Okay? So I can count on uh, those services be provided. Here, we're saying a class person implements the services provided as stated by this presentable interface, okay? What that means is that person, the behavior of person, it may have a lot of other behaviors beyond presentable, but it has to adhere, it has to be able to service, provide the services guaranteed by presentable. In this case, the services, it has to be able to draw itself. When you call it to draw a method, it draws itself. So, if I had this, and now I have a person, um, uh, if I had a person called person, perhaps in my population or whatever, right, I could actually call draw me on with using person as the method here. And actually pass it to this, treating it as a presentable. Okay. So, so in other words, person has many other characteristics beyond a, a presentable. This is just, this only lists two characteristics it requires. The only to draw it and then to make it disappear. But if I have a person, it can do all that. So now if I have some code which counts merely on dealing with a presentable thing, um, person provides that service, so I can, I can provide it as a call to draw me. And, um, this a reference to a person, and it gets treated in this code. It gets treated uh, in terms of it being a presentable, because that's one thing that it is. It is a presentable, but it's also other things. It provides other things beyond it. But because it, by virtue of it being a presentable, I can treat it as a presentable here. This is what's called subtyping, um, and it allows it allows us to reuse this this one method for anything that that forms a presentable. So I might initially have, for example, class deer implements presentable so, as well. Okay, so if I had, let's say, if, if I had uh, several different classes of agents, maybe yep. I have people, deer, trucks, yep. airplanes, yep. but I have a specific ID number associated as a characteristic of yep. agents yep. in each of those. Yep. And let's say I've got a um, this would be a, a, a method that counts or that spits back the ID number. Yeah, so serial number. Serial number, yeah, there you go. Okay. Yeah. So then now I can call that yep. on each of those things right. I just and it'll give me back the particular That's right. Okay. So so they you know the deer and the people um, and the trucks would all have different characteristics, right. right? So presumably the deer would have would have antlers, where the people would not. Right. Um, and uh, the uh, the trucks would have engines, where the deer would not. So um, they may differ in all lots of details, but if deer and people, if the, if the deer class and the person class and the truck class each implemented serial number, then you could, for the sake of some code, you could all treat them as being some serial number thing. Right. And you could call ID on them and it will give you back a number. Serial. Okay. Yeah, it will give you back a serial number. And that would allow you to reuse some code mm -hmm. that would otherwise have to be written separately for person on the one hand, for deer on the other, for trucks on the other. Um, it could allow you to reuse just one version of that code that operates at serial number of things. You'd just be 
in that code, you'd be dealing with them with respect to their being a serial numbered thing. Here, I'm dealing with these things with respect to them being a presentable thing. So I'm passing, as an argument, person, a person, and treating it as a presentable for the sake of this. I'm passing a deer and treating it as a, as a presentable for the sake of this. And because it's a presentable, we know that it has a draw, it, it supports this service of drawing itself. And so I can write this code here and I can reuse it. This is why I said a few slides ago that actually separating out these two, the implementation on the one hand from, from the interface allows reuse. We have separated out the implementation, all the vagaries of what it means to be a person from the fact that it supports this interface, this presentable interface. This supports a presentable interface. And by virtue of separating those two, knowing that it presents a present it has a presentable interface, I can treat it as a presentable um, in some cases. I can reuse the code essentially that that deals with presentables from one to the other. Does that make sense? It's a very this is a very subtle notion. So yeah, if I can work this out a little bit. Yeah. I'm thinking two things and maybe you can tell me if Yeah. One is that um, one way that it makes this more clear in my head is to think of there being different groups of programmers who decide on the interface of the manual. Some of them work on one side. Right. Some work on the other. That's right. Because how they exchange information is, is already agreed. That's right. And so the code could be completely different on the other side. That's, that's kind of like the reasonable Yeah, thing. so uh, this is true. So you could have, for example, um, a. Um, uh, you could have many potential implementations of a set, for example. And uh, you could have different sets of programmers work on different implementations of the set. And each of them might have its own uh, benefit costs, sort of costs and benefits, its own, its own trade-offs. Perhaps one of them provides um, really, really fast ability to deal with small sets. The other is really good for very, it's very memory efficient and it deals with very large sets. But each of them could be treated as a set in the sense that you could ask, is this item in the set? Or you could ask to do, perform a union between this set and that set. And you don't have to worry about whether it's, it was created by this set of programmers or that set of programmers. As long as it satisfies these needs I could treat it as a set, and I don't have to know about who created it or when or all the gory details of how it was created. Does that? Yeah, yeah, that's 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 part of it, and I feel like there's the, another thing that I'm yeah that I'm starting to get is there's just another level of abstraction that instead of there being kind of one interface, there's you're kind of uh, abstracting different elements of this. Interface. Correct. So to take correct, a, I'm thinking of like yeah. the post office example. So that's like, right. You know, everything that goes to the post office is. I don't that's right. There's a stamping kind of quality to it, and it has to be carryable in some way. That's right. So there's size requirements, but you could, each of those could be a separate interface. That's so exactly right. Does that make, does that Th that's right? exactly right. So here we're talking about sort of partitioning out the functionality, as it were, that's provided by a given class into pieces within. Um, uh, and, and each of those pieces uh, describes sort of different characteristics of this. And, and they might relate to different standards that are germane. So for example, this computer here, if I were to look under it, um, uh, what I'd see is that it adheres to certain standards, okay? So there's certain standards it adheres to in terms of um, the, uh, the electromagnetic radiation it gives out. So I can carry it on a plane uh, because it won't interfere with the avionic systems. There's another set of standards that it, it maintains with respect to basic sort of ergonomics. And there have been people who studied ergonomics and you know, um, identified uh, appropriate standards for that. It might have another set of standards with regards to uh, you know, uh, power consumption. That, it, that it's guaranteed, you know, that's what all this thing is, right? It's guaranteed to to only take power at sort of this range and so on. So this computer might, might have a set of standards that apply to it. And by virtue of that, if someone at the airport was concerned about my computer, they could pick it up and they could look at that thing on the back and see, oh, this computer adheres to the, whatever it is, the ANSI standards for 
for um, you know uh, electromagnetic radiation or whatever. It's not ANSI. It's another organization that does it. But but those standards it adheres to the you know standards with respect to power consumption. It adheres to these standards about uh, uh, flammability, right? Um, so that it won't blow up on the on the on a plane. If I were making a bicycle, yes, it's not going to have any of the you know uh, radiation standards. That's right. But it might have the flammability. It might, yeah. And you might use some inter depending on what you're creating. That's right. You might want it to be presentable or not presentable. That's right. Numbered or not numbered. That's right. Okay. Sure. That, that, that's right. And so, so the, a key point here, though, is that um, in these different domains, if if we had one of these things and they they have those standards, like someone at the airport could check. And they don't have to know all the details of how it does it. They don't have to know about the circuit boards involved and where they were manufactured or the particulars of where the transistors, you know, uh, the, the transistor sort of uh, technology used. All they know is that it adheres to that quality standard. So, you know, as far as our criteria, it's fine. And then they can deal with it accordingly. And similarly, um, by knowing, say, that a person is, instance of person class is presentable, we can deal with it as a presentable. By knowing that it's serial numbered, we know, okay, we can call its ID and get back its ID. Um, so we can kind of partition out that functionality. Instead of all just implementing it all together, we can partition it out, we can um, limit what features we need of it at a given time, because like, look, if, if we had to implement a draw me separately for deer, and a draw me for a draw me for person, uh, and a draw me for truck, um, maybe we'd have to do it for Mack truck, and you know, uh, whatever other uh, many trucks there are. I'm not a truck expert, but if we had to do that, we'd end up having to create a massive amount of kind of extra functionality. But really all we care about in this method is that it's presentable. And so we treat it as a presentable for the case of this method. Yes. So this makes sense to me for, from, I guess, kind of a, uh, a convenience standpoint. Yeah. But isn't there also the potential of a draw of a drawback in that um, if you don't get the interface right, yeah. then you can really yes. like screw things up really, really, really True. And so the interactive True. effect, True. I guess, is kind of what you're, you're absolutely right. And the interface should evolve very, very slowly compared to the implementation. Okay. It's, it's just like setting any standard. Like if the National Institutes of, of uh, Weights and Measures or whatever it is in the, in the state, what well, standards of technology, um, if, if that screws up in its definition of some something, it could cause big trouble, right? Um, uh, if if they screw up in how they define uh, fuel economy standards, right. um, it could cause a lot of problems for manufacturers or for selecting, knowing which vehicle to select or whatever. So uh, generally, those standards are going to evolve a lot less quickly than the technologies that implement them. And so they're cast in stone a lot earlier, uh, and they live for a lot longer. So like the standards we use for computer networks, TCP IP is, is sort of a a famous one, but there's there's uh, a number of, of other relevant protocols and standards. Um, these were formulated back in the 70s mm -hmm. and so on. But you know, successive computers in successive decades have made use of those standards, and we have to live with the baggage of those standards. So there's certain things we can count on, certain things we can't count on, and there's people working hard to try to come up with better standards, but. Everyone's very aware that you can't just implement those standards overnight. It's going to be a very grueling process. And so one of them is, for example, IPv6, yeah. which, which has come out to replace IPv4. The fact that they only chose you know, um, uh, four successive 256 sort of possibility um, numbers uh, for, for each component of, of the IP standard um, limits the number of computers on a network. And they did that thinking that it would not be a real effective constraint, and now, 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 now it's a big constraint. It's almost perfectly predictive. Yeah. <laughs> if you think that something's not going to be a constraint, you almost automatically. Th th that's right. Um, that's right. So, uh, 
So yeah, I mean, people are working to formulate new standards, but standards have a very um, low rate of, of evolution. And what we're going to see is that any logic, and your models at any logic are all built around standards. Okay, they're built around standards set by Java, and they're built around standards set by XJTech, the folks who created any logic. And by and large, they're quite flexible standards. They're quite they're quite uh, well thought through standards. But they are standards, and that's going to be some measure of vulnerability in the sense that um, if the standard doesn't quite work for your needs, it may be a bit of a pain. But it also affords you the capacity to, to um, get in a lot of savings, to do this sort of thing. Instead of writing three methods, you write one method, something along those lines. Instead of, instead of having to write your own connect to method for your agent, or get connections number method for your agent. You're going to be able to use any logics, get connected methods number, which works for any agent. Mm -hmm. Okay? So your, your, your model may be a big honking model with 20 different types of agents in it. But you're going to be able to make use of the code written once and debugged once by any logics team for agents, and you can be able to use it for any of those. exactly what you'll do. Okay. And there are tens of thousands, maybe hundreds of thousands of interfaces that have been defined uh, across the world and, and that have accompanying many implementations of that interface um, that, that you can use in your any logic models because of this. You basically could use these libraries and we'll see some of that today. Okay. Uh, so uh, this is very uh, tough stuff, but it's extremely powerful stuff. I don't expect you to come away with a good understanding of how this works, but you have to understand some of the power it opens up, and I'm providing slides here that maybe you can look back on later um, as you slowly develop comfort with this, and we're going to dive into models which make use of this functionality, okay? Um, we actually have been making use of it, I've just been brushing it under the rug. Um, okay, so we've been We've been dealing with, um, with this notion of subtyping from the perspective of interfaces in classes, okay? So we have a set and there's many implementations of the set. The US government sets standards for fuel economy and there's many particular vehicles that implement those standards, right? Um, the uh, National Institutes of, of Science and Technology set standards for um, weights and measures, and there's many, there's many uh, scales that then apply those standards for weights and measures. NIST may set, um, gosh, I can't remember the, the agency that sets the guidelines for, um, for the uh, electromagnetic radiation adhere to that thing. So we have here a notion of a standard or a contract that's defined by an interface construct, and then many classes that implement it. Okay. Um, this is uh, separation of interface from implementation. It turns out that that's just the, um, well, and, and I should say that there's a, there's a notion of behavioral compatibility here. Um, to me, real implementations of this, all of these classes here that implement this interface have to stay true to its promises. So if set promises that you, know, it, you can combine together any, any two sets, even if they are empty, and then you provide an implementation of a call hash set, that has to preserve that property. Okay. It has to be able to handle combining any two classes, any two sets, even if they're empty, an empty set. So if set to says certain things are possible, these classes have to adhere to it. If presentable said that you have to be able to draw and disappear something, then any class that implements that has to be able to support those two methods. Okay, um, uh, just like anything that claims to support the fuel economy standards has to be able to pass certain emissions tests, etc. Okay, so we've concentrated here on subtyping between an interface and its implementation. We said the implementation was as a, a subtype of the interface, and that allowed the implementation to be substituted wherever the interface was required. So. Here, we required something that 
was some instance of this interface that implemented this interface presentable, and then we could give it a person, or we could give it a deer, because those are subtypes of presentable. Okay, there are also subtypes of serial serial number, but there are subtypes of presentable, so we could substitute them, and we could do it with confidence because we knew that they had to adhere to these standards as laid out by presentable. But it turns out we can you could use this general principle to construct extensive hierarchies, and the, the observation here is that often in the world, we go look out there. Objects, there's often relationship between objects. And sometimes you find objects that are just a special type of another. So a Mack truck is a special type of truck. A fawn is a special, is a type of deer. A deer is a type of cervid. A cervid is a type of mammal. A mammal is a type of animal. Um, coming closer to home, radiologists and orthopedic surgeons are both types of doctors. LPNs and RNs are both types of nurses. Physiotherapists, doctors and nurses and chiropractors are types of health professionals. Health professionals and patients are each types of, of people. And by virtue of this, I mean, this is not merely a sort of uh, musings on the structure of things. There are certain characteristics that carry down to doctors by virtue of this hierarchy. They have certain characteristics that, that people have in general, okay? Um, so um, here we might construct a hierarchy of this sort. So a patient is a person, a health professional is a person, a doctor is a type of health professional, an orthopedic surgeon is a type of doctor, etc. And for example, a person interface, if we define an interface for person, a contract associated with personhood, it might have in our model methods that include is infected, a method that says infect this person, and methods to get their aid in sex, okay? In addition to that, so that might be true for all persons, okay? So if we go here, we look, all persons within this hierarchy, and that means everyone Everyone here supports a question like, so I can ask a nurse, are you infected? Is infected? A radiologist can ask, is infected, etc. But health professionals might additionally have a uh, have a method called something like recent patients that yield patients seen by that professional over some period of time. So for a, for a health professional, I might ask them. What are the patients that have been seen by you over some period of time? A doctor interface might have a method called residency institution that gives him back the institution where they did their residency um, as part of their training. So what I'm saying is that because of this hierarchy, there's a certain structure to the services provided. All of these have certain shared characteristics because they're people, but doctors might have certain certain sub-characteristics like the residency institution, they're unique to them, and health professionals might have certain char characteristics that are limited to that clade, that sort of sub-area of the tree, okay? Um, okay, so um, if, if we were to delineate these sort of hierarchies of this sort, um, it turns out to offer some value, okay? So let's flip back to that slide there. The first is what's called polymorphism. I mean, we've already seen this, this whole thing about presentable. So what I would argue is that any code that can operate on a person, for example, print out their name or, or, or infect them or count the number that are infected, I should be able to pass in any one of these people as a person. Okay. I should be able to treat them as a person because they have personhood, but knowing that they're that they may have lots of additional characteristics beyond that, but they, they share these characteristics of a person, okay? So we call it polymorphism. We can pass them around, say, a doctor around as a person for certain types of operation, um, and, uh, and that may allow us to reuse some code. Another thing is, is understanding. I mean, um, we can group together shared characteristics in, in the places that uh, they're required. And uh, we know that we don't have to constantly redefine all those characteristics for, um, for the doctors uh, way down at the bottom, the fact that they can be infected, the fact that they, um, that they have an age and the sex, et cetera. Um, I've argued reuse because of sort of polymorphism. And then it um, turns out there's, there's an 
an aspect of extensibility that I that I won't go into too. Um, okay, so when it comes to polymorphism, what I don't want to go into the gory details of this, but suffice it to say that someone may be a person. We say that's their concrete type. That's kind of their yeah. true, most detailed type. But we could treat them as a presentable because person implements presentable. It provides that service, so we could treat them as that. So this is called their apparent type for this code, a presentable. But their actual type is person. Similarly, their actual this one's actual type might be a deer, but its parent type for this sake of this code is as a presentable. Okay. And what we call um, uh, when we call presentable of uh, presentable code such as p dot it will handle the definition uh, as provided by person if it provided one. Uh, for example, so any logic models are built around a set of classes with subtype relationships. Okay, and the presence of these relationships allow us, us to pass around instances of subtype as if it's an instance of the supertype. So this is an example of some of the any logic subtyping. Um, your model might have everything from the agent level on down. So you might define a deer and a buck and a doe and a bird and person. Um, men and women classes that are both uh, examples of person. Any logic divides these things in blue. So agent class. It's an instance of an uh, agent is an active object. A main is an active object. And by virtue of being an active object, it's actually presentable. So this is active object. The fact that it's an active object allows it to be, <coughs> it's actually something above active object, but all active objects are presentable on the screen. Okay, um, uh, here's another set of hierarchies in any logic. Transitions come in four types. Transition, a rate transition, a condition transition, a timeout transition, and a transition message. And these are classes in any logic, behind the scenes. You typically don't have to worry about them, but they're there. Any logic is built atop this sort of notion, and this is what's called object-oriented programming. This is part and parcel of object-oriented programming. You construct these hierarchies so-called type hierarchies that capture commonality. Okay, um, but it turns out, my point is you can use this to your benefit, and it's also helpful to understand what you're, when you're trying to understand the antibody code. Similarly, experiments come in several different sorts. Any of these is an experiment. If it's an optimization experiment, it's a classic simulation experiment, a parameter variation experiment, as we saw through sensitivity analysis, or for calibration, or for regular running, these are all experiments. And by virtue of that, you have all the functionality that's made possible through an experiment. Java 2, we saw this before. I didn't really explain it much. But we saw last time that there's a number of collections classes. A queue is a collection. A list is a collection. A set is a collection. And any collection is iterable. In other words, we can put it in a for loop and iterate over it. And so any of these, any set, can appear in a for loop can appear in a for loop. We can treat them purely as a collection, for example. We don't have to know what they are secretly, but as long as they're a collection, they have certain properties, certain services that they provide. Okay, so these are some type hierarchies, and then it's a variety of others. We actually saw this a little bit when we were outputting data. There was a file writer I think I may have used, etc. Um, okay, so it turns out that this becomes very relevant if you are seeking to customize some aspects of these operations. So who can remember where, in what lecture did we think, see a thing called resource unit or entity? What lecture was that in? Remember what was oh, discrete event. It was discrete yeah. event simulation. So it turns out that entities are defined as a class in any one. There's, there's an entity. And um, and in fact, if you were to open up a discrete event simulation, what you would see is um, you'll say new entity, for example, to create a new instance of entity. Now, if you want an entity to carry around some additional information, like statistics, with it, you would create a subtype of entity that has that additional information, maintains all the properties of entity, but carries around some additional information. And similarly for resource unit, this was used 
to keep track of like the doctors or the rooms. If you wanted to keep track of information about them, like their history, who did this doctor see over the past few months? This particular doctor, for example. You could create a subtype of resource unit and and have it carry around that history information. Okay? And the key point here is anything that works with an entity would work with my entity, my sub subtype or subclass of entity. Anything that works with the resource unit would work with my subclass of it. And yet it could carry around additional information. Can you, can you share subclasses? So yep. if I so let's say I made a subclass yep. that carry around information and yep. I wanted to apply it to resource units and entity. Would I have to write a separate, a separate one or how would I do that? Uh, that's a good question. Um, so in other words, if I wanted these to carry around sort of similar information, yeah. Um, yeah. So um, that's, that's an interesting question. Um, there are ways of doing it. Generally speaking, what I would do is um, have both of these have a reference to sort of that, to a, to a class which has that information in them. You'd have a subclass of each of these which then reference this information as defined by another class. Okay. Um, there's, okay. So Java does not allow what's called multiple inheritance. Right. And there's a thing called mix-ins that allows you to approximate this. Uh, but suffice it to say that um, one of the best ways to do it is to just create a subclass of entity if you want to carry around, let's say, history information, and it was the same type of history information, you'd have a, uh, you know, my entity or, or Bill's entity that's a subclass of this, and it would have a reference to their history information. There'd be a Bill's resource unit that's a sub subclass of resource unit that would have a reference to Bill's resource unit, uh, to Bill's history, uh, to that history information, and. And the history information will be uh, in, captured in a, in a different, different class. Um, okay, um, so the idea here is that uh, we can capture a hierarchy such as in previous slides by uh, defining interfaces. Each interface specifies the methods to be supported. And then, um, uh, then we can set up these relationships of subtyping through uh, so-called subclassing. So, I'm going to talk here about, about subclassing because it's, it's used in any logic. And this is a subtle distinction. I've talked about subtyping. Subtyping has to do with relationships of contracts, sort of what's promised in each place. Subclassing is about relationships with implementations. So we say A is a subclass of B if it, has, if it starts with the implementation of B and then extends that further. Okay, um, so subclassing, if we have A as a subclass of B, A is a subtype of B, it can be substituted wherever B is expected. But it also builds atop the implementation of B. So I wanna, I wanna take a look at this. Um, uh, right, um, so I think, uh, okay, yeah. So I'd like you to load up an SIR agent-based model right now from the sample models, okay? Um, and I'll try to follow along here, make sure that it's not already loaded. Um, okay, this is SIR agent-based calibration. Let me close that out, okay. Here's SIR agent-based, okay. And once you have that open, I'd like you to go to, um, uh, oh, okay, uh, excuse me. Um, oh. I, I had you open up uh, the wrong the wrong model here, but we'll turn lemon into lemonade here. Um, so let's uh, let's go take a look at uh, a few things here while we're on this model anyway. Okay, so SIR agent base. This is the model with which we started uh, earliest in the class, I think. I'd like to to use this to show where some of these things come uh, come into play. First of all. You'll notice once this is open that for a person class, um, you can go to an advanced tab and you'll see that there's two things, uh, two fields, one that says extends, one that says implements, okay? Um, this is in the advanced. Uh, uh, so implement states 
the interfaces that this implements. Extend states which class the implementation of this extends. So which class does this inherit methods from? Does this inherit fields from? Does this inherit the implementation of? Which then we can um, further extend. So you'll notice that there's some... Okay, yeah. So, so I may have gone... I, I, I didn't want to spend too much time in it, but maybe I, I should spend a little bit more time on this. Um, okay. So there's a relationship... We have been concentrating. Um, I'm going to go back a few slides. We've been concentrating and talking about this sort of thing on what's called subtyping. Okay. So here we might have this this hierarchy, and this allows us, just as here, D or implementing presentable allows us to to wherever presentable is expected, we can provide a deer, mm -hmm. for example. Um, wherever presentable is expected, we can provide a person because it's just another type of presentable. It's something that provides all the presentable um, characteristics. This hierarchy is all about that subtype of relationship. Here, if man is a subtype of person, we can substitute a man wherever a person right. is expected. It provides all that, it, it adheres to that contract of person. It provides all the services the person provides. Similarly, a person could be substituted wherever an agent is expected. Because it's a full-fledged agent, it may have additional properties, but it adheres to all the promises, all the guarantees, the contract of an agent. And that's a subtyping issue, and it's a very powerful issue, but um, and it allows us to reuse code. So this code up here, this draw me code that operates on presentables, this can be reused for deer, for persons, for trucks, whatever, as long as they adhere to, as long as they implement a presentable interface. Okay, um, so that's what's called subtyping. Now. That is a very powerful feature of object-oriented programming in Java um, as a particular language. We could make, reuse this code for anything that implements it. Turns out Java goes further than that. So there's a, there's a further relationship called subclassing, okay? Um, that, that automatically provides subtyping, but provides additional features with it. So here, this slide was with respect to subtyping. But we could also have subclassing. In fact, this relationship to per to a person to agent is a subclass relationship. I'd like to show that to you and talk about what it means. So let's, let's just go to any logic now. And we're going to strip away the, um, uh, the veneer here. And I'd like to go right click on this and do open with, oh, okay, it's going to force me to, to build it first. Okay, I've just built it. Right click on do open with Java editor. Okay, and now, now uh, the veil has been cleared and we can see what we're dealing with here. This is code we can't modify. This is code that's produced by any logic. We can't change it. But if you scroll down, what you'll see is there's a thing that says public class person extends agent discrete 2D. Okay? That extends is, is, is talk about a subclassing relationship. And subclassing brings with it all the features of subtyping, um, but it also brings code reuse. Okay? So see, it says subclassing brings two things. So if, if person is a subclass of agent discrete 2D. Anywhere an agent discrete 2D can be used, you can give it a person. Because it provides all of the it provides all of the services of agent discrete 2D. So if we were to look up in any logic help, and you don't have to do this with me, but I'll I'll do it. If I were to look up here and I were to go in to the any logic uh, API reference and I were to look on this, um, and, uh, and I were to look at agent discrete 2D. Here, agent discrete 2D provides a lot of services. Mm -hmm. It provides all these methods. It provides the connect to method. It provides the deliver method. Where did we use connect to? Uh, way back when we first started, we were building our networks. 
building the networks. Where do we use deliver? Messages. Um, find random empty cell. That was actually used in one of the models we looked at at one point when agents needed to relocate to a different cell because they were going to move. Um, get agent at cell. Uh, get environment. Get connections. Did we use that? Yeah, we used that. We used, who did we use it on? Did we use it on something called agent 2D, discrete 2D? No, we called it on our instances of our agents, right? Like person. We called it on person. But what I'm saying is that every person is an agent discrete 2D because sub Classing this this mention of extends, which means agent person is a subclass of agent discrete 2D. It comes with subtyping. So everything that's that uh, is part of the interface of agent discrete 2D, we have to be able to do with sub on a person. Okay, we have to be able to do it on on person too. So subtyping is about subtyping is about the promises made and and. And the fact that person is a subtype of agent discrete 2D says we should be able to do everything that we could do in agent discrete 2D, we have to be able to do on a person. It has to be a legitimate agent discrete 2D. It has to adhere to all the same promises. That's all good, but that doesn't get us very far as far as our implementation goes. So folks, agent discrete 2D already implements all of these methods here. All of these methods are implemented in that. This is actually a class. Someone's actually taken the time to figure out code to, to implement connect to, to implement uh, deliver, to implement get environment, get connections. People over in St. Petersburg, Russia, wrote the code to do that. Okay? Now, if. Okay, sorry. So, what you do is uh, in SIR agent based, you can right click on person and do open with Java editor. Okay. Um, okay, okay. So if it's grayed out, you do model build to build the model. We'll actually generate the code and then you should be able to do it. Okay. Um, sure. So, so folks, um, here this extends is, is saying that person is a subclass and that means it's a subtype, but it does something more. It means it inherits the implementation of. So if I said this, actually for technical reasons you couldn't, you couldn't do that, but um, if I said agent class person implements, if this, were an, if this were an interface, agent discrete 2D, and I said this implements it, all it's saying is that anything I should be able to do with this, this is gonna, any promises this makes, any, it, all parts of its contract, person also adheres to. So all of these things described here, I should be able to count on for person. That's great, but then I have to do a lot of work because <laughs> I have to go and I have to implement these. I have to go and actually create an implementation of this, uh, of all those methods for person. Then I could pass around as an agent discrete 2D. Great, but a lot of work. Now, if I instead say extends, what that is saying is that not only does it implement it, not only does it make uh, adhere, not only saying you should be able to count on person providing all those services, it also says it takes the implementation of agent discrete to do all that work that was put in there and it reuses it in person. It basically inherits all the properties, all the method implementations, all the fields of agent discrete 2D. They're inherited by person. They're, they can be used by person. In other words, person builds atop all the features already implemented in Agent Discrete 2D, but extends them with additional features. Okay. And because of that, I don't have to go and re-implement, say, connect to, um, the connect to method. If, if all I said was that it implements it, I'd have to implement connect to. Because no one else has implemented it for me. I have to implement it. Just like here, if I say this implements presentable, I'm gonna have to say, okay, how does a person look on the screen? I'm going to have to write its draw method. For truck, I'm going to have to have it show in a different picture of itself or whatever. That's about implements. That's about subtyping. Subclassing is all about that it, um, it extends the implementation. It, it takes the implementation as already, already done, and it simply builds a topic. It inherits all the methods that have already been written. 
it, it inherits all the fields that are there, all the types of information that are stored, the properties bit. But it, it can add more to it. Yes? So is it almost like may I and can I? So may I is your implementation, but then your extension is yes. may I actually can. Let me put it another way okay. that I think will be helpful. Implements is all about the what. Okay. What do I promise? It's about my promises. It's saying this lower one, person implements agent discrete QD. That's saying anything that you should be able to count on by the contract of, of agent discrete QD, person also adheres to. It's about the what. Okay. The top one is about the how. Okay. The All top right. one okay. is about how I go about accomplishing that. Okay. okay, let me yes. let me give another example of this though. Um uh, so, so let's imagine, um, and forgive me, I'm just uh, coming up with this. Okay, so, so, so imagine you want to be a FedEx franchise, or per later career franchise. Let's say FedEx, it's easier to say. Um, okay, so you want, you, you want to be a, a, a FedEx franchise. And suppose FedEx says has certain rules that if you bring in to a FedEx franchise, they have certain guidelines, certain standards in place that you could look up on the web. Perhaps, you know, if you bring in a package by 10 a.m. and you pay X dollars, judging by the number of miles required, um, that package will guarantee to be in its destination by, you know, midnight the next day or something like that. Okay? That's implemented. Right. So, so I could set up as a FedEx franchise and I could say, okay, I am going to provide that guarantee. And uh, suppose I provide that guarantee and all other guarantees FedEx uh, uh, you know, uh, requires, it's, it's standards. I can do that however I want. Right. I could use the Pony Express if that gets it there. I could, I could have a Learjet that flies you know, my packages. I could have the blue flame carry it uh, across Canada, you know, to its destination. I could fly it, you know, using a helicopter, whatever. It doesn't matter as long as I adhere to those standards, okay? That would be an example of, of, of me implementing their, uh, their systems. I, as long as I adhere to the systems, I can hang a shingle and say that I'm a FedEx outlet. People can bring, can be referred to my FedEx outlet and know with certainty that their package, if their package adheres uh, in terms of when it was delivered and the amount of money paid to FedEx rules, that, it's, that it will be delivered by the regulated guidelines, right? That is all about the promises made. But because I adhere to FedEx promises, I can hang a shingle there. Now, that would be one option for implementing it. But an alternative is... Exactly. So I could make use. So again, implements is about the promises. And by this terms, I would be a legitimate FedEx franchise because I adhere to all the promises. I, I, have, I have my FedEx franchise, but I guarantee it. I adhere to all the guidelines, and therefore um, uh, I, I satisfy the contract. Right. And that's what the second one is about, satisfying contract. It's about the what I accomplish. The top one is about the how. And one way is I, if I can get it via Pony Express, that's one way. But I prefer to make use of FedEx mechanisms, perhaps. Perhaps I would prefer to make use of FedEx's computer system, for example. Perhaps FedEx has a fleet of airplanes in many airports, and I will deliver my thing to their airplane at a certain time. Maybe they have, for all I know, maybe there's FedEx trucks that drive around and pick things up at the various franchises, and I make use of their trucks, and I make use of their their computer systems, and I make use of their uh, flight uh, flights and, and airline fleet, and I make use of their phone system and complaint center. In short, I make use of all the systems that they have implemented already and debugged and worked out all the details. Then I'm extending FedEx. Now, I could also, you know, I could, I could be extra good. I mean, I could, I could have extra features of my own. You know, every time someone comes into my FedEx franchise, I could give them a coffee. I could, I could 
take half their money or something like that. As long as I give FedEx all the money they're due, I could charge less. I might even offer them extra latitude because I'm extra efficient in the back room. And so I might allow them to deliver their package till 10.15. Um, I can actually, as long as I stay within the guidelines of FedEx that anything delivered before 10 is, is handled, I might actually have additional latitude. And there's actually a whole theory about this, of what it means to adhere to it. The point is, I might have additional features that are uniquely my own. You know, I offer people a, a free massage, you know, after shipping their package or whatever. But if I'm using their mechanisms, that's about the how. Extend is about how. Implements is about is about the promises. Now, extend also, extend also comes with the promises. So, if you're extending, you also have to promise to adhere to the same guidelines because it comes with subtyping as well. So, I I need to be able to treat a person as an agent of street duty perfectly legitimately. But it also comes with the implementation. It comes with being able to build a top here, build a top FedEx's mechanism. Does that help at all? Yeah. yeah. Okay, um, so implements, implements you actually are only allowed to use with, with interfaces. You can only say implements and interface. Extends is what you do, one class extends and other, because classes are what have the implementation. An interface is, is, is promising. Remember extends does come with, with an implied subtype relationship as well, so anywhere I can, I have any code that can operate an agent discrete 2D, I can pass a person in as an agent discrete 2D, but it extends it beyond. And that's why, ladies and gentlemen, if you look at the code for person that we've just been perusing, um, uh, there's lots of other code here. There's lots of detailed code, um, but there's no implementation of connect to. If you search this, connect to, there's no, there's no implementation of that. Where does that implementation, why is it that I can call connect to on a person? By virtue of what? Just to, sort of following my, my thoughts. Why is it I can call connect to on person? It's because what? Yeah, yeah, that's agent, when I call connect to, right, um, as it's declared by agent discrete to do, all it does is it, if I call it in person, because person doesn't define it anew, in other words, doesn't override it, it would be called, I just go and I default to the one that's provided with agent discrete 2D, okay? Um, you'll notice that some of these, though, are what's called overridden. See, it says at override there? And you'll notice that get name of, um, I'm gonna have to um, check on this, but uh, get, get name of is provided by, so let's, let's check this, uh, get name of, yes, there we are. Um, you'll actually see that get name of is not provided directly here, but it's provided by active object. You'll see, you'll see within this, um, this thing here, within this agent discrete 2D, You'll notice that it gives a summary of the methods, and then it says methods inherited from agent methods inherited from active object. This is telling you what methods have come with it because it's extended each of those in turn. Um, so in fact, if you go up to the very top of this, ladies and gentlemen, you could see this is the extension hierarchy. So agent discrete 2D extends agent, which extends active object, which extends utilities, which extends presentable, which extends object. So anything that's implemented active object is inherited by agent. Anything that's extended here. But we have the ability, so here if you search for get name of, name of, you'll find that it's provided by active object. But we can override it. We can actually provide our own definition of it here. And so this actually overrides the one. In other words, it overrules it, it, it sort of um, supplants it, um, the one that's provided by active object. So there is one provided by active object. Anything that's using an active object can count on there being a get name of, but this is the particular implementation we're gonna use. This is the particular, this is how we're gonna perform uh, get name of. Anyone working with an active object, 
if we were to go to this. Anyone working with that is going to know that, um, that they can call get name of because they see it as part of this interface. I could search down for it here. So get name of, they can see that it's here, but the one I actually get in person is, is the one that's overridden here. So if I call get name of on a person, I will actually invoke this one because it's been overridden, okay? Um, now, this is an awful lot to absorb. And again, I don't expect you to get all of this. Um, this, is, this is stuff that some of my second and third year students in computer science undergraduate struggle with to understand and particularly difference in subtyping and subclassing. Um, but remember, uh, subtyping allows one thing to be substituted for another by, because we count on the promises being kept. Subclassing goes beyond that. It gives all that, but it also gives implementation. And it's by virtue of the fact that subclass, your classes in any logic, your agent classes are subclassing, like agent, agent discrete 2D, that they have all these properties of agent discrete 2D, or all the properties of agent, all the properties of active object, okay? And here are all these properties. So that's why magically you can call connect to on an agent. Magically, you know, it knows how to connect to. You didn't write that. How does it know how to connect to? Where's the magic? Well, there ain't no magic here. It's just, it's just that it extends this so it gets all the features of agent discrete 2D. And that gets all the features of agent, all the features of active object, et cetera. So all of these uh, are made possible by this successive extension. Now, you'll notice there's something else there as well. So if you scroll up, if you scroll up here, up to the top, you notice it says all implemented interfaces as well. And those are those are interfaces. So this serializable, that's an interface in Java, java.io.serializable. And if you were to go on the web right now and search for it, you'd find an interface definition for it. It says what, what services are provided via this interface. And what this is saying is that, that agent discrete 2D provides all of those. Okay, so this is all going on behind the scenes. Um, if you go to main, in the same way, and you shouldn't have to recompile your thing, but if you were to go open and look at what it provides, you'll notice it extends not agent discrete 2D, it extends active object. And you'll notice that was one of those that this other one inherited from. So if we went up to active object, what we'd see is that active object, well, it's presentable, among other things, um, but it also provides a bunch of other things like creating it, um, assign initial conditions, uh, get owner. By the way, get owner is, is really secretly what's called when you call get main, um, is replicated on create, to string, all these sort of things are provided by virtue of being an active object. So this is, this is uh, how things are operating behind the scenes. Behind the scenes, any logic as a whole is made out of these inheritance hierarchies. And that allows it to reuse code, just like draw me can reuse things um, across many, many classes that implement it. It also allows it to avoid redefining things. You could extend, you can use subclassing to avoid re-implementing methods. And then um, you'll notice simulation as well is, a, is also um, a subtype. So it extends experiment simulation uh, with this type parameter called the for, for main. Okay, so, so this is uh, subclassing behind the scenes. And sometimes you will notice, for example, um, if we went back to, um, uh, here's, here's agent, for example, and agent discrete 2D. If we were to look at connect to, what you'll find is um, uh, the definition of connect to takes an agent discrete 2D. You see that? Okay. Um, and if I were to go to Persid here, and I'm just going to, um, you don't have to do this, but I'm going to uh, pop in here 
and I'm going to say put in a fake action here this dot connect to and you'll notice it wants as as the thing to connect to an agent discrete 2d see that that that's what it, it wants to be connected to um, or or by the same token if I said like uh, get connected agent here um, remember we've called that before that returns an agent discrete 2d right okay so when we dealt with that um, uh, I don't know if you remember but I kind of brushed it under the rug um, I'm going to actually open up our example model that um, called minimalist SIR network ABM you folks don't have to do this but I'm gonna uh, use it to show the principle when we built this up I don't know if you remember it but remember when we had people connected whoop, connected with other people remember we had this we had this connection thing here we had dynamic um, and we called this dot connections number where is this uh, defined get connections number that's defined in one of the super classes so called super class the thing that it extends this get connected agent that returns an agent and it turns out agents you can ask uh, get x for or get y but if we wanted to treat our agents as persons we would have to do something like this. We would have to cast this to a person because get connected agent actually returns an, uh, a reference to an agent 2D. So in short, this get connected agent is in fact returning an agent continuous 2D here in this case. Um, uh, why was it discrete 2D in one case and continuous 2D in the other? Yeah, exactly, exactly. It's the environment, it's the associated environment that dictates that. So this agent continuous 2D, that's, that's our neighboring agent. The reason it returns an agent, not a person, that it's not smart enough to realize it's a person is that this method, get connected agent, is in fact defined in, in agent continuous 2D. So get connected agent. Um, if you oops uh, get I thought it was defined there maybe it's in um, maybe it's in the next level up uh, let's let's see where it is so get connected agent get connected agent there it is okay yeah so so it's right there's one of the methods returns an agent continuous 2d that's why it's not smart enough to return a person and that's why we sometimes have to get it to find out to treat it as a person we have to coerce it to a person. Okay, so so the point here is that sometimes in your methods or in your building up a model you will see the side effects of this hierarchy. The fact that because this is implemented in agent continuous 2D it returns an agent continuous 2D, not a person directly. Okay, so that's that's that behind the scenes and that's all well and good. Um, they're subclassing, but you too can make use of subclassing. Um, so for example, if we want multiple agent classes in a network like this, I actually provide an example model which does this. If you have several agent classes, each of these different colors is a different agent class. Maybe you have physiotherapists, you have nurses, and you have doctors, and they're each different colors. You can create an agent superclass in your model. By that I mean a, a class that will be subclassed. You could create multiple subclasses by that extend it. That's what we call it, a superclass, and a subclass extends that. And then, um, and then just add the various types of agents to the model. You initially start with it empty, then you add them in. So these are just different agents. Um, they're there, and, and you could um, you could add them in. So um, uh, right. So I was gonna loaded a different model here let me just see if that is um, if this model I think it's one of the examples um, um, there it is okay so folks if you go to example models multiple agent classes in network um, and we were to go down to that here we see there's an agent A 
that is an agent B. You can see they each have sort of different colors here on the upper left, and there's an agent C. And then, they, then there's so, something called an agent superclass, okay? Um, and each of these is a subclass of the agent superclass. Remember, we define that subclass relationship right here in the advanced tab. So agency is extends agent superclass. Agent B extends agent superclass. Agent A extends agent superclass as well. Um, and by virtue of extending agent superclass, we're going to be able to put them all in the same network. Now, if I go to main here, and I were to go look at this agent collection, what class do you think it is? What agent class is associated with the agent collection? Anyone want to guess? It says agent A collection, but but actually, don't don't be misled by that. What sort of class do you think that is? Superclass. Yeah, it should be the agent, the agent, uh, the agent superclass, and, and you can see it says agent superclass. Okay, and the reason that has to be the one is because all the others are subclasses. All the others are are just sort of different variants of the agent superclass. There, it's kind of like this is saying this is a collection of fruit and then you have oranges, apples, and bananas. They're all examples of fruit and so they can be all mixed in in a fruit collection. This, this is a collection of agent superclass and so agent A, agent B, agent C are all subtypes of that so they can be substituted in. And by virtue of this we can end up having a network which is composed of multiple types. Now where this becomes more powerful. So that's a little bit interesting. Where this becomes more powerful, though, is when we start to combine it with not, that was an example of sort of sub, we really made use of subtyping there. We could substitute one where the other was expected. Where the agent superclass was expected, we could substitute the agent, agent A, agent B, agent C. Where this becomes very powerful is when we have subclassing beyond it. So, um, I have an example model, and I don't know if it's provided here. Let's 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 go check here. Um, I don't um, I don't think it is. I'll see if I can provide this to you. Um, uh, but it's a um, so this is for sharing a class. Oh, oh, um, sharing a class only and. Uh, this is HPV model. There it is. Do you have access to that? Share your class only under your examples? So what this what this one does is it takes advantage of this super of this subclassing and superclassing in order to save rework. So the basic idea here is that um, that we're going to have certain characteristics that are common to both males and females. For example, um, uh, asking about if someone's susceptible, infected, immune, vaccinated, if they're a smoker, current smoker, former smoker, negative smoker, um, sexual activity group, um, and various things like that. Okay, So those are going to be common to um, to all people. And similarly, smoking state chart, for example, is common to all people. Uh, sexual activity group state chart, whether which one they're in, is, is common to all people. Okay? So this is going to find characteristics that are true for both males and females. Did, did, were people able to find that model? Oh, okay. Okay. Um, we'll get that get that on there. Let's go look at now female. Um, so well first look at male. Um, uh, males in this model as arguably in real life are somewhat less complex. Um, so here we have male state chart. Um, and let's uh, let's go um, see if we can uh, scroll scroll out a bit uh, from this. Um, gosh, I uh, thought I should be able to, to zoom out here, but um, uh, it's not... Um, 
huh? Um, in any case, uh, this is uh, this is an example of sort of male male specific components. So they can go between several states, vaccinated, susceptible, infected, immune, and they have some. Um, uh, and this this state chart is uniquely their own. If you go to female, the state chart for HPV infection is quite a bit more involved because they can progress onto cervical cancer. So their state chart is much larger yet. And this is actually based on a published model of, of HPV infection. So they have a state chart which starts with some similar states as males, but where um, it's, it's much, much more extensive. So this model basically takes advantage of uh, sub subclassing to group together person sort of generic person attributes in one place, and then males are defined as a subclass of person here. So you can see it extends person under advanced. Females are defined as a subclass of person as well, um, but they have a set of additional attributes. Now it, now it turns out any logic doesn't support this great. There's some workarounds you have to do. But it is a viable scheme, and once you know the workarounds, it's straightforward. So um, uh, in short, this allows us to have a population uh, within Maine of persons. Um, and I'll, I'll try to show this, a population of embedded objects, population of person. And then males and females are just located within that. Um, it's initially, this is initially size zero, and you add these in. So this is an example of using subclassing within a model to accomplish, uh, to accomplish uh, grouping of shared functionality in person, and then having unique features, uh, such as the HPV progression state charts, um, and additional features uh, located within the appropriate subclasses. Does that make sense? OK. Um, Right. Um, okay, I'm not going to go into um, these details. Um, I'll leave those for um, uh, for for those who are interested to go through them. But what we've just seen is something about subtyping and subclassing. Um, trying to watch my time here. Um, I think what I am going to do is to. Um, Right. Um, just looking at how long this. Um, I think I'll leave this probably till till next time, and we'll see if we can uh, see if we could go into a, another particular model right now. So I'm gonna. Uh,